Good morning, good afternoon to wherever you are in the world and thanks for joining us today. This is Range 4. Today's webcast we're going to be talking about ways of working and particularly uh, value outcomes that count. My name is Helen Beale, I'm a DevOpsologist here at Range 4. So what exactly are we talking about when we say ways of working or ways of thinking? Well, those of you that know Range 4 will know that we do a lot of work around DevOps. And when we talk about DevOps, we talk about ITSM and IT service management and its relationship with Agile and Lean. You might have heard us talking about the harmonious polygamous marriage between those three things and how DevOps is a, as a kind of love child, if you like, of that. We also talk about safety culture sometimes and site reliability engineering has come through from Google in the past couple of years. We talk about system thinking, organisational change, learning organisations, theory of constraints, holacracy. There's all these things that we talk about and maybe there's things we haven't even invented yet. But what we really increasingly feel at Range 4 is that these all have things in common. They're all ways of new ways of working, new ways of thinking, but replacing traditional methods. And they have a lot in common with each other. So here's a kind of list of common characteristics that we've identified to all of these things. They're all concerned with incremental change. So the idea that we're not going to do things in really massive lumps of work. We're going to break things down to smaller pieces, which is going to allow us to reduce the risk associated with each piece and receive very fast feedback. So we're creating these fast feedback loops and that enables us to pivot much more quickly so we can respond to change as it happens. And in the world that we live in, which is highly disruptive and very fast moving, it's really important that we can pivot fast and change really quickly. We also have a concept of having these small and dedicated autonomous and cross-functional and multifunctional teams. So the idea behind this is if we've got small pieces of work, we need small pieces of teams or small teams to be able to cope with these small pieces of work. We want them to be dedicated to a specific area as well. So we don't want them to have to learn lots of new things all the time and context switch and context change. We also want them to have some autonomy so that they can own the end-to-end -end life cycle themselves and they can make decisions themselves without having to wait for other teams or management to tell them what to do. They are empowered to make those decisions themselves. We want them to be cross-functional, again, because we don't want them to be waiting for another team of DBAs or an IT operations team to perform a release. And we want them to be multifunctional. So ideally, we want every person in that team to carry multiple roles. So if development's finished on that piece and we need to do some testing, we're not just waiting for the testers. Anyone can do some testing. We also want this idea of the long-lived product-centric thinking, so we're moving away from project-centric habits. Project-centric thinking makes us think in very large chunks, it makes us do very large phases of work for things like planning, it creates lots of handoffs and potentially creates lots of delays, it creates lots of, lots of dependencies. We want people to be empowered, we want them to be able to participate and we want to have peer review capabilities. This is very much again about not waiting for other people, it's about removing waste out of the flow of work. As I said earlier, we want to break dependencies, we don't want to create new dependencies and create new methods of working to manage those dependencies. We want to embrace autonomy, remove these impediments and streamline our processes and ultimately be able to think end to end in a value stream manner. So thinking about where the idea starts and how it flows through until we have a value outcome that's delivered to the customer. So we want a place where the definition of done is not I did my job, but it's the customer has received value. We want to embed experimentation into this. So we're not just blindly moving forward doing work because that's what we're told to do, but we're actually actively seeking feedback and making decisions based on that feedback that we're receiving. This focus on customer delight is core to all of these ways of working as well. And as I keep on saying, the delivery of these specific value outcomes, which is what we're gonna specifically focus on talking about today. And we want to increase throughput and stability as equal forces, so no trade-off between them. We want more value outcomes delivered, but them to be really good value outcomes that work as expected, that don't entice a customer and then disappoint them by being low quality or not operational. So there's a question under all of this then with these ways of working, and it's kind of who's leading who? We have this concept of the business, and I put that into quotation marks because we're very 
it, very subject to using that word in technology and I feel it's really misplaced because the technology is teams are part of the overall business and you know sometimes I talk with other colleagues about this and they'll say that HR do this as well they talk about HR and the business but it shows that we often have thought of technology as a, a separate team and for many organizations that we work with that have been around for a really long time you know sometimes as long as 250 years we do understand that technology is a relatively new part of their organization and that it would have started off really small just doing maybe some erp and some back office things and it would have grown and grown and then it would have been divided up and seen as a cost center and seen as an order taker to the organization but that's not really where we live now. Where we live now is a place where all these businesses are being digitally disrupted. They have to embrace technology in order to thrive. So I've got a little dog on there, he's wagging its tail, because it's like, you know, is the technology wagging its tail and leading the business, or is the business leading um, what the technology teams are doing? This is increasingly becoming blurred. So we've moved from this place where we talked about aligning technology with the business. We've moved through a place where we've talked about technology integrating with the business. So we've gone past there now as well. We're really talking about technology is the business. It is part of it, they are inseparable. And we're seeing an increasing amount of companies and organizations that describe themselves as technology companies, even though their core business isn't the manufacturing of software applications or hardware or cloud. So I've got a few examples here. We've got Alaska Airlines who describe themselves as a technology company with wings. Um, we've got Target who are a very large US retailer that have very frequently for several years now stood up and described themselves as a technology company, indicating that they understand that the way that they use data to inform what they have in their stores and what they do online and how they interact with their customers is now more important in many respects than their bricks and mortar business. Same with Domino's Pizza. For them, they describe themselves as a tech company or a data company. Um, see what we do, we all know what Domino Pizzas do. Uh, Hiscox, an insurance company, also aligning themselves with this technology thought. Again, recognizing that the way that they use data to interact with their customers is more important. So we want to talk about ways of working more than DevOps, but the DevOps, uh, State of DevOps 2019 report just came out last week. So just a few kind of notes on this in terms of these outcomes. So um, reflecting again on what we just said about these technology companies, um, again, what we've recognized in the State of DevOps report is that delivering software quickly, reliably and safely is at the heart of technology transformation. And then this is the key bit and organizational performance. There is continued evidence that software speed, stability and availability contribute to organizational performance, including profitability, productivity and customer satisfaction. We keep coming back to our customer satisfaction as part of our value outcomes. Our highest performers are twice as likely to meet or exceed their organizational performance goals. So on the right here, we can see elite performers. We can compare the elite group against the low performers. And there that we find that elite performers are deploying code more frequently. Um, they have a much shorter uh, lead time, 106 times faster from the, from the time they commit code to the time that they deploy code. So those are our throughput metrics. Our stability metrics tell us that they are 2,604 times faster to recover from incidents, and they have a much uh, lower failure rate. So these metrics here are related to value outcomes in that they tell us that if we have uh, good performance in these areas, we know that we are creating some sort of value outcome. So we'll have some more thinking about what, how we define value outcome in a moment. But just a little bit more from uh, Accelerate the book behind the State of DevOps reports, some advice in there of things not to measure and things to measure. So we don't measure outputs anymore. We do measure outcomes. We don't measure productivity, but we do measure value. We move away from measuring maturity and towards capability. The reason it's quite subtle, the language here, sometimes we actually talk about fluency now over and above capability. And the reason that we've moved there really is about that if we talk about maturity, it kind of says that there is a utopia or a horizon or a place that we're going to stop at. But as we know, the world continually moves around us. We're continually discovering new ways of doing things, new ways of thinking, new ways of working and new tools to support those things. So as we talk about capability, it allows us to move the bar 
uh, more effectively and compare ourselves more effectively within our organisations and also outside. Other advice is not to measure lines of code. Well, many years ago, many software developers were measured on lines of code. It's how people got paid. But of course, often these days, we can create a much more elegant and efficient solution with something smaller. It's this little and often idea. It says don't measure velocity. That's really, we do want to measure velocity, but we only want to do that within our team, at our team level. And we do it in our team in order to understand what we're capable of. So we all do it to continually improve. We do it to create consistency and predictability in the way that we operate um, with our stakeholders. We don't measure utilization. What we do measure is delivery lead time, the deployment frequency, the time to restore service and the change fail rate. Those throughput and stability metrics that we just looked at. We don't want to measure on an individual or local level. And those of you that watched our last Ways of Working webcast, which was about leadership, will remember that we talked about quite a lot in that about things like KPIs and how to reward people to drive the right behaviours. What we're really trying to avoid actually is uh, goaling and rewarding the individual, but actually focusing on the team level um, and then at the organisational global level, but moving away from comparative metrics that drive the wrong behaviours. So wow, what we're trying to do here, well, wow, it's a ways of working. Wow, it's also about customer delight. So we just saw about a few things about customer satisfaction, but really the way that the world is moving, particularly with digital disruption, is that we have to overachieve. We have to aim for the stars and hit the moon. We have to delight our customers. It's no longer really enough to satisfy them because our competitors are delighting them. This means that we have to deliver more value outcomes and we have to understand how our customers are feeling. So some of you may be using Net Promoter Score already. It doesn't work for all businesses. So with some businesses like very, very B2B businesses, things like repeat business, and repeat purchases make more sense, but it's a really, really useful way of understanding, one of the most effective ways of understanding how your customers are feeling. And um, you can see how it works here. Basically, you take the uh, amount of promoters and you, you uh, minus the amount of detractors, you end up with your NPS. And we're basically asking people, would you recommend our product or service to your friends or family? That's the core question. You can use this as an ENPS as well, so an employee net promoter score. So you can use it to understand how your employees are feeling. Ask them whether they would recommend your place of work uh, to their friends or family. So a really key way of us understanding the impact of value. So value, how do we define value? How do you define value? Do you think the way that the target, does, um, companies like Target define value is different from the way that somebody like Kiscox would define value? Um, this gentleman here, Jeff Goldthorff, is, uh, is, uh, if you download the slides and slideshow, you'll find the, uh, the link to this article. But he um, says some very interesting things about value and the way that it has a lot of ambiguity within an organisation. It's another one of these areas that when you're doing one of these evolutions to embrace the, these ways of working that we're talking about, it's something you need to have a conversation with openly, honestly, transparently, share it within your organisation about what your definition of value is. Because what you'll probably find is that it varies from part to part of your organisation. So what Jeff tells us is that if we use the term business value, it tends to be said by execs and other leaders, and they tend to make or mean something that makes it easier for the business to be successful, um, which usually equates to making money, and it usually uh, results in increasing profit margin, which will normally benefit the leadership team primarily and the shareholders, so it's often linked to increase in shareholder value. In some organisations, they may have uh, rewards or bonuses based on overall company value. But we're kind of undecided about this, really, because it can be very ethereal. People don't really kind of feel like they have much impact on it. Some people get bigger bonuses than others and it can create quite toxic situations. But that's one definition of value. Here's another one. Customer value. This sounds better. So customer value, the people that tend to say this are our product development teams. These are the people that are the most customer facing in these new ways of working. And they tend to mean something that makes the customer more successful. So some new feature or new product and what gets rewarded? Something like launching an app. 
And we'll reward a team perhaps on completing some new thing, but we tend not to reward so much on just new features. Um, but we should, we should understand what the value is of that new feature. We should experiment in a way that means that we hypothesize about what that value will be, however we're going to express it. And we should also measure it after the event. Then this final term, organisational value. So our internal facing teams tend to say this, um, and they tend to mean something that makes the job of other teams within the organisation easier. So again, it equates to features or systems, but internal ones. So it might be something like improving the way that we deliver infrastructure or improving the way that we deliver new features by implementing a continuous deployment system. And I'm not saying there's no value in that, but we're not talking about customer value there. So Jeff says this, and he says, meaningful changes in customer behavior, i.e. outcomes, are the only way to know if we've de delivered value. Can customers complete a task faster? Can users be more productive in the system? If the answer is yes, we are delivering value. If the answer is no, we are not. Here's the best part. If we are delivering value, then our impact metrics, those high level metrics of business health, start moving in the right direction as well. The connection here is explicit and especially with digital products and services easily correlated. So this reflects back on what we just learned from the state of DevOps reports. We know that organisations that are good at deployments, that are good at recovering from incidents, that have low change failure rates, that are good and have a very short lead time, uh, between committing code and that code becoming available, that new feature becoming available to customer, we know that there is a correlation between doing those things and becoming a higher performing organisation. So who is responsible for customer delight then? Who is responsible for creating these value outcomes that will delight our customers and ultimately result in higher levels of profitability if we're a capitalist organisation? Is it the CEO? No, I don't think it's the CEO. Is it the marketing team? They're the ones that tend to talk about such fuzzy things about customer delight. No, I don't think it's really them either. We are all responsible for customer delight. So everybody that's involved in the manufacture of the value stream on the delivery of this product or service. So how can we make that believable for everybody in our organisation? How can we make people feel and act and behave as though they understand they have responsibility for customer delight, as though they have responsibility to experiment with and understand and improve those customer value outcomes? This chap, Steve Denning, says, it means that each team's work goals must be spelled out in terms of client outcomes, not just outputs within the firm. An intelligent measurement system requires that the results of the firm's work are measured in a way that ensures outputs are not only counted as positive progress if they succeed in, sorry, that outputs are only counted as positive progress if they succeed in delighting customers. Equally, an intelligent measurement system must be able to register the outputs which irritate or disgust the customer are failures. There you go, you've got the counter side of customer delight to customer irritation or customer disgust. And we suggest here that they are considered failures, that experiment has failed. We've learned something from it. And those of you, again, that work closely with Range 4 will know that we spend a lot of time working with our customers talking about failure in particular, and failure in the con context in particular of failing fast and failing smart. Um, and really, failure is a learning opportunity. So if this is a failed, failed experiment, that's fine. We decide whether to uh, follow it with another experiment to try and improve or whether we just put that experiment away. Uh, but these failures create negative events for the firm because they undermine its capacity to survive. This is core to everything we're talking about here is survival. So in terms of defining value, how do we do that then? So, the best place to do it, according to Steve Denning and to Range 4, is really within the user story. Um, so there you have the benefit. This is the most simple way, really, of writing the user story. As a something, so as a uh, purchaser of shoes, I want to be able to find the shoes that I want really quickly so that I can get them as soon as I want. So that's in terms of value outcomes that Jeff was talking about. That is about the user having a better experience, being able to find what they want more quickly and receive that value that they're looking for faster, perhaps for an event that they have at the weekend or something. 
So in these new ways of working, we do want to measure, but we really want to get away from measuring to target. So it's tempting to measure teams on things like deployment frequency, but we have seen in our customers uh, poor behaviours being generated by focusing too hard on things like just measuring on deployment frequency. And we've seen people um, separate the development part of a cross-functional team out from the testing in order to be able to perform more frequent code deployments. Of course, what they've done there is they've compromised on stability and quality. They are potentially just deploying more stuff that isn't useful. So we need to be careful about measuring to target. We do want to measure to learn, and we do really want to measure to improve. Those are two key ones. It's quite a shift for organisations to move from a place where they are typically measuring to target to a place where they, they measure to improve and the teams have that level of autonomy and empowerment that they are able to experiment um, and learn from it. So again from Steve Denning, really kind of thinking a bit more about where you might be moving from and where you're trying to move to. So if we have these kind of traditional approach, this project centric approach that we talked about earlier on. And there are a number of problems with this. So a great deal of time and effort is often spent on things that are of low priority to the ultimate customer, thereby delaying delivery of things that the customer most dearly wants. So many of you will be familiar with Kanban as well, and Kanban's principle that we pull through the board the work that the customer deems most important. This requires us to have a close feedback loop with our customer. It requires us to have the ability to do things like measure NPS, to do things like potentially things like feature toggling so we can, uh, or feature flags so we can um, do a canary deployment to a small group of people and test out whether people are going to like that. And if they do like that, we can make it available to larger and larger groups. But we have to find ways of not just delivering 100 features at once as we would do in an old project driven area, but actually breaking down at the feature level um, and understanding in the user story what the value is and finding out um, whether it's delivered that value, whether you're using NPS scores or you can use monitoring systems like Dynatrace that will give you business intelligence on how long it's taking people to do these things and how many users are using it. There are ways of getting that feedback loop. Another problem, because the management has often not examined the relationship between the amount of effort that each individual component of the specifications will take or how much delight it will generate, no sensible decision can be made on trade-offs. This is why we want these small teams that have autonomy within them that make, are able to make decisions and receive feedback and do work in very small chunks. Um, each individual component there we can understand because we have this constant inspection and adaptation in a typical agile environment that will look like a, a two weekly a fortnightly sprint uh, where we have a sprint planning meeting and the team that understand the product that understand the technology platform that understand the user story that has been carefully refined with them by the product owner they can give a very accurate view on how long this component will take to deliver and it can be delivered very quickly because it's small at very low risk and we can receive feedback on the amount of delight it's generating very fast Another problem that we have is because many tasks are grouped together into a large single specification, the over project typically takes a long time to complete with the likelihood that the customer's situation will have changed by the time of delivery. As a result, the eventual product or service, even if it corresponds to the project specifications, will not be what the customer wants at the time of delivery. This is underpinning these ways of working, this ability to pivot and change according to the customer's requirements, according to how they are changing what they need. And the last covered that the output does not delight the customer, a significant amount of rework is probable. Rework is wasteful. Uh, one of the things we talked about is lean. So lean contributes hugely to this thought about how to remove waste, how to avoid having to do rework. And again, taking our incremental approach, this top one on this list here, having this incremental approach means that we are able to reduce this risk, this risk of not getting the right thing done, this risk of spending lots and lots of time doing something only to discover that we misinterpreted the requirements in the first place or that actually the regulations changed or that actually our customers changed or that actually our competitor has delivered something new that we now need to to try and match in our environment 
So these new ways of working um, all kind of boil down to these, these same things, this idea of little and often and doing things in a small way. And they all boil down to thinking of things in a concept of a value stream. So being able to understand the end-to-end -end life cycle and understanding what the value outcome is that we are trying to deliver and what we want to do with that. So we've got a few minutes now for some uh, Q&A. Um, if anyone has any questions, now is the time to ask. I'm going to get the Q&A open. <laughs> 